He gets there two weeks into his uh, freshman camp. Unfortunately, during strength and conditioning, he uh, he was trying to tell the coach he had like pain in his neck, chest, and like shoulder area, like this whole area, mm -hmm. to the point where you know it, it was just excruciating. And as he's telling, you know, Coach Lynch, the the strength coach at the time, he uh, Coach Lynch said as he's you know describing his pain, he ultimately collapsed. And and when he collapsed, mm -hmm. it was instant mortality um you know he he had a, an aortic dissection which you know as you're very familiar you know that the chances of living is one percent hello this is dr vats again with the about that life podcast the podcast that focuses on life or living intentionally forever it's a podcast for anyone who wants to focus on health through the lens of fitness nutrition and health literacy as you know, with the events that occurred through football or any sport, we oftentimes get concerned about the health of the athlete. Now that doesn't stop at the high school athlete or the college athlete or even the professional athlete. Even masters athletes have some risk of heart disease with sport. We often think that exercise is the great equalizer, but what we found is that even individuals at the tip top peak shape in terms of their fitness can succumb to the ills of sudden cardiac death or unexplained death. Our guest today is one that looked this issue in the face and literally said, not me. He focuses on creating awareness, creating a program that links not only communities, but individuals and organizations to understand the importance and the impact that sudden cardiac death has on not only the athlete, but the families and the communities that support them. Again, it's been a, a, a wonderful ride um, working with him and, and learning, and, and we're on the precipice of, of something big. And, uh, again, I, I just want to get into our conversation. I'm going to uh, introduce to some and, and present to others uh, Mr. Rob Ott, Otty. Uh, and again, I, I just want him to, to, to say hi, to tell you a little bit about himself. How are you doing today? What's going on? Look, oh, man, uh, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I've got stress, but it's good stress. You know, I've got a, a lot of moving parts. Uh, a lot of things are happening. But, uh, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited about, you know, where we're going, where we're at now, uh, and where we came from. So tell us a little bit about what is your story? Because I know, and, and you got to tell it in two parts. Okay. You got to tell it before the event, you know, how life was, what you were doing, where you grew up, and then after the event. And you know what I'm referring to because I think that was um, what I like to call or what the listeners understand that I say are, is a pivot point in your life where it literally shifted the focus of of what you said hey hey this is my new target this is my new purpose so so before and after what's your story yeah so uh you know we'll take it way back you know we'll start from the beginning i grew up in uh, a town called salisbury maryland which is uh, as i like to refer to close to the beach right so 30 <laughs> to 45 minutes from ocean city maryland a pretty popular tourist destination on the east coast so i got to grow up you know enjoy the life at the beach for the most part uh, but man, like I was a sports fanatic from the, the moment I could remember, uh, big baseball guy, as far as what I played, uh, that's the sport that I excelled in the most, um, you know, did that I played football, played basketball. And as I grew wow. up, you know, I just, I kept playing, kept playing until I got to high school when unfortunately I couldn't pass the physical to play high school baseball, mm. uh, which was pretty, pretty tough. Um, you know, when I was uh, about 11 years old, I was run over uh, by a car and drug about 100 plus Damn. yards that uh, really, you know, messed up my lower back. Uh, even though I couldn't play them, boy, I was still involved. I still watched them. I still attended all the games. Uh, it was still a big piece of my life. So yeah, you, you were passionate about it. I mean, again, even when you talk about it and I know and we'll talk about kind of the three, four, five, six, seven hats you wear, but in all of them, yeah. you know, kind of sports and fitness are at the center of that. So so after that, you 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 get to high school, you can't play a sport you love and but you still stayed engaged in sports and oh, yeah. still maintain that relationship. So during that process, you know, I was I was at the football games, basketball games, baseball games. And, you know, heck, I started fantasy, fantasy sports when I was 14 years old, you know, before the Internet, you know, and, and that, that shows, man, I feel like I'm getting old. 
uh, because, right. you know, we were calling in our lineups <laughs> every Thursday over the phone, you know, taking stats from the newspaper. So that's, that's fantasy. Crazy. That's fantasy sports at the beginning. And then you kind of come full circle. Right. You know, as life went on, uh, I, I met my wife. Right. Um, on myspace.com of all places. It was pretty neat. <laughs> Uh, so you are dating yourself now. You are you, exactly right. We, I'll give it to you though. I'll give it to you. I, I, I love the honesty. Yeah, that's that's before the Facebook. Right? I didn't even know the Facebook was exactly. Uh, so you know, we we find each other, and uh, you know that brought me from the eastern shore of Maryland over to Central Virginia, right in the Fredericksburg area. Okay. And that's uh, that's when I joined her family, and mm-hmm. that's where we, uh, you know, that's that's when I got to meet Darius, right? And that's that's kind of the part two of the story. But that's when Darius right. became, you know, a part of my life, or I became a part of his, I should say, uh, when he was wow. nine, ten-ish, you know, in that time frame. He was he was a young kid, and uh, got to, you know, then go in and, and make my own family, right? You know, get married, uh, and through that, you know, Darius grew, right? And then he uh, he got to the high school level and he started playing football um, amongst every sport, pretty much football, uh, basketball, track, and soccer excelled in all of the above and uh football was just that passion that's i mean he was lightning fast ran a four three six he uh you wow, know just man, he, he he was the star wide receiver he was the star cornerback he he was the star team kicker you know <laughs> he, he did it all so mm-hmm. you know as he as he was playing football um man he get better and better and you know he went to you know started going to camps in the off season and, you know, his recruiting started to pick up early, right? You know, we had Power 5 programs reaching out, showing interest. Man, you know, this kid from small town nowhere in Virginia, Locust Grove, mm-hmm. Orange County, right? And, uh, you know, this kid, this kid, he can play. So through that process, you know, it, you know, it kind of filled him up, man. Sure, I can do this, right? You know, I, I can play at the next level. You know, I don't have to pay for college. You know, now it's, now it's real. And, and I kept stressing, man, you gotta, you gotta take those academics serious. You gotta make sure you're good in the books. And, um, you know, his 10th grade year, he had a setback. He was at a camp in uh, Charlottesville rivals camp and he tore his ACL and I believe his MCL. Set oh, him back man. and, uh, really kind of put him in a dark place, you know, was questioning whether or not he wanted to play football again. And in many conversations like, man, look, you can't give up on what you're passionate about. Right. Sure. You just had this devastating injury, but the reality is you're stronger than that. Right. You can come back and be a, even better than you were before. And, you know, once he got it, in his, you know, his head and, and he started really focusing on coming back, that's exactly what had happened. So he came back. Now, now talk about that process, because I, I don't think a lot of uh, athletes, especially at the high school level, appreciate what has to go into that road to recovery. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I, and I tore my ACL, my MCL. Uh, I think I had a tibial plateau for, I had pretty much. Yeah. So I had it and, and, and I understood what, right. I understood what that meant. I was a little older when those things happened, but, but it does impact you. And, and you talked about that place where he had kind of lost sight of, yeah. what he felt like his purpose was. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately we see it, you know, time and time again, and we stress the mental health aspect, right? And I think that goes hand in hand with what he was going through. You know, uh, he just went from kind of the peak of, you know, his youth, his young, you know, life, you know, big programs that you watch on TV are reaching out and, and saying, hey, you know, we want you to be a part of what we got. And you you feel good, right? Especially coming from a, a small town, Definitely. you know, don't even think you're being recognized or seen except from the local newspaper. And then mm-hmm. you've got, you know, SEC program reaching out or ACC saying, hey, you know, you can play ball. Mm. So when when he had a setback, you know, he, he started to, he didn't have a setback just on the field. He had a setback in the classroom, uh, unfortunately, and, and kind of lost mm. focus. Um, and, you know, his grades weren't where they were where they needed to be, right? Not where they needed to be to play division one college football. So once he got his head back in the game through the rehab, uh, which was, you know, it was hard to keep him on the couch, you know, to put it politely. I mean, he wanted to get up. He wanted to put the crutches down. He was ready to go. Uh, and ironically, <laughs> I mean, he recovered pretty quick for, you know, the type of injury that he had. And, right. you know, once, once, you know, he followed the process, he went through rehab, went through the, 
the training, you know, then you then you got him back out in the field and he was he was running routes again, right? And he was doing those things. That's wonderful. And then, you know, let's go test the waters again. He goes he goes to a rivals camp, uh, I believe in Charlotte, and that's when he ran the four three six. So his back his recruiting went his recruiting went up to down, back up, because exactly. you record a four three six. Yeah, I mean, you, Somebody you, don't look even, at you. you don't even have to be a, you know, a good player, right? I mean, they want the speed. <laughs> they can figure out how to make you good. The downside was the academic piece, you know, didn't follow as quickly. Um, so not mm-hmm. that he had poor grades or bad grades. You know, he just didn't have, you know, that three, you know, three, 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 five type GPA that's, right. you know, going to get you to, to these power five programs, you know, how you need to get there. Come into his senior year, he had quite a bit of interest. Right. And programs were saying, hey, you know, we we need we need this. We need that as far as academics. And that was the setback because he had all the talent. Right. They wanted him. They just couldn't. They basically couldn't offer him a full scholarship based on the academic piece. Right. Um, so he had tons of interest uh, from Virginia Tech. They kept, you know, trying to get the, the academic piece, you know, where it needed to be. But at the end of the day, the best they could do was a PWO because of the academics. Now explain, you know, some of the listeners don't, PWO, explain to them what that means. Yeah, so a PWO is a preferred walk-on opportunity. And mm-hmm. with that, you know, there's no scholarship involved, right? It's just guaranteeing you a spot on the team. You know, you've got to come out and you've got to work to get that scholarship. You've got to work to get play time. Um, so there's a lot, you know, that you bet on yourself for. But we've seen quite a few people walk on and be very successful. I mean, there's plenty of guys in the league right now or plenty, exactly. plenty of guys in college in general that have walked on and have, you know, found great success. So it's not a bad route by any means. Uh, you just have to bet on yourself and, and be dedicated to the cause, right? So he had that. Uh, Bud Foster, you know, the, the great defensive coordinator, Bud Foster, spent tons of time making the, you know, three and a half hour trip down here and, you know, seeing him at school time and time again, just really mm-hmm. letting him know we want you, right? We want you to be a part of what we got. Um, and he went as far as coming down the week of their bowl game for one last pitch oh, and say, Hey, come to Virginia tech, you know, take the PWO, earn your scholarship and, and be a superstar. Um, so there was that. And then he had, uh, the university of Maine, the university of Maine came calling, right? Coach, mm-hmm. Burkett, you know, was, was pretty persistent in you know, in his DMS and it was the 11th hour. I mean, it was real late in the process. <laughs> And, you know, he, we're sitting at my table and, you know, Darius is like, Hey man, like university of Maine wants me to, to come up for an, you know, for an official visit. And I was like, official visit, like that's all paid for. Heck yeah. Right. Go, yeah. go take Let's that go. trip. And, uh, you know, we sat there and he's like, man, I, I don't know that I want to play for Maine. Like, I, I don't, I don't know anything about Maine, Right. <laughs> so we, you know, we joke about that. And, uh, you know, I was like, look, you know, I'd love to come. Let me look at plane tickets. So I'm looking at flights and flights were about eight, nine hundred dollars, you know, last minute. And I was like, man. man, like I can't come out of pocket, you know, next week for 800, you know, for a plane ticket. So then I, you know, I GPS it, try to see, you know, what the drive looks like. And it was just over 13 hours. I was like, well, 13 hours. And that's just a little longer than Disney for me. So, you know what? I might be able to drive it. Let's roll. Well, guess what? Then Mother Nature kicked in and Uh-oh. the East Coast pretty much saw a whiteout. So that was the one trip that I couldn't take him on. I couldn't take him on. And he had never been on a plane. He had never left Virginia. He opted to not come to my my wedding, which, you know, we got married on a cruise ship in the Bahamas. And he chose not to go on that cruise and stay behind by himself. His whole family came. He chose to stay behind so he could play in the playoff game. That's how dedicated he was to the game. Dedication. Dedicated. Dedication. Uh, downside was, you know, they lost big, but he was in the playoffs. Uh, but that just shows, you know, he was very dedicated to his mission, right? You know, he, he was like, I don't know. I don't know. I said, look, just think of it as a job interview. Go to the University of Maine. There you go. Talk to him. Learn from him, right? At the end of the day, you just got a free trip up north. You just saw a new place. Been on an airplane. You can say you did all these things now. It was a fun experience. Come back. Commit right. to Virginia Tech. And uh, so he decided to go. He flies to Maine, you know, by himself in a snowstorm. 
And uh, yeah, he gets there, you know, the next day he texts me, he was like, it feels like home. And I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> Where, where's this going? <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I'm, again, I'm looking at it, you know, it's a small town, Orno, Maine. I mean, very similar to what we live here in, in Virginia. And I was like, okay. all right, well, I can see that, you know, it's like old, old town type, you know, atmosphere. And, you know, that following text is I'm committing to the University of Maine. I said, what? He didn't waste any time. I said, he what? didn't waste any what? time. Right there. <laughs> the University of Maine. Are you serious? Like, why? And uh, then, he, you know, he told me it, it felt like home. The, the coaches and the players were genuine. Right. It felt like a family atmosphere and they made him feel welcome. Like they made him feel like a part of the team, even as a recruit. And that's, that's the difference that was, a lot of times. That's what it was. So mm -hmm. do you take a PWO opportunity to your dream school, or do you take a full ride scholarship to a, a school that showed genuine interest in, in support and love in your game and your character? And he ultimately chose the University of Maine. I said, uh, you know what? If you suit up, I'm going to make the trip. I'm going to come support you on opening day. I don't care if you run down the field on kickoff and then you sit on the sideline. I'm coming to the university. I said, I'm going to come see you. You coming. Well, um, July 2018, uh, he goes out to the University of Maine to kick off his college career, you know, to, be, to become the young man that he wanted to become. Um, but more importantly, you know, be that football player that he always dreamt of, of being, right? And, you know, we had plenty of stories that, hey, man, people's going to know who Darius Minor is. People's going to know, you know, you came from Orange County. People's going to know who you are. And, uh, you know, he gets there two weeks into his uh, freshman camp. Unfortunately, during strength and conditioning, he, uh, he was trying to tell a coach he had, like, pain in his neck, chest, and, like, shoulder area. Like, this whole area mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, it, it was just excruciating. And as he's telling, you know, Coach Lynch, the, the strength coach at the time, he, uh, Coach Lynch said, as he's, you know, describing his pain, he ultimately collapsed. And, and when he collapsed, oh, it was instant mortality. Um, you know, he, he had a, an aortic dissection, which, you know, as you're very familiar, you know, that the chances of living is 1%. You know, right. you, you've got a very, very slim chance. And, you know, the university did everything they could. Um, you know, obviously they didn't know what they were dealing with. Nobody did. It just happened. And, you know, they, they, they tried all the, the things, you know, CPR and, and, you know, 911 got there as quick as they could. And there wasn't a thing that anyone could do that could really save his life. Um, so, yeah. So just so people understand, and again, thank you for, for sharing. And I know it's always tough and, and we know. Yeah, I get a little crackly. I'm I sorry. Know the story. No, I don't apologize. That that shows your connection and your passion. And, and even for me, just hearing the story and hearing him uh, kind of reach that dream and reach that place and have that happen. Um, but for those of you all who, who don't know, an aortic dissection. So the aorta is the big blood vessel that comes off the heart. It's the blood vessel that supplies blood throughout all the body. A dissection is essentially a tear in one or all of the, the layers that involve the aorta. And so when it does tear, I mean, you, you essentially don't have blood going anywhere. It's exquisitely painful. And oftentimes, as, as Rob mentioned, uh, the, the likelihood of survival is exceedingly low. Even when all things work together and you're in the right place, it is still a very um, you know, difficult space to be in. And, and it's one of those things where, you know, screening tests or other things are, and I know people are wondering, well, how would we have known or how do I, again, this is one of those rarities that occurred and, and we can talk about potential mechanisms, but it's not something that you say, okay, this person can, you know, yep, you're, you're going to have it or not. It, it's not that simple. And I think that was probably one of the most challenging things because this was a young man that did everything right. He had the family support. Did it, you all did everything right? He was in the best of shape, and I think that's the the, the scarier part uh, about certain conditions that contribute to to sudden cardiac death and those type things. So, um, was that kind of the question that you and your your family asked? Or I, I know there was a ton there was, of there was a lot, right? You, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, when you, when you get news like that you, you automatically start, you start asking why, right. You start questioning a lot of things, right. I mean, 
you question, you know, life, you question faith, like you question a lot of things because like you said, you know, this young man was healthy as an ox, right? I mean, he ate right. You know, he, he didn't, he didn't put things in his system, you know, that a lot of others do, right? He, he didn't do drugs right. and alcohol. He didn't party. He didn't smoke. He didn't do those things, right? This kid was 100% focused on making a better life for him and his family. And, and he had, you know, the dream of, you know, buying his, his, you know, mom and, and his family, you know, homes and cars, you know, he told his grandparents, man, you know, I'm going to get you a new house. And he had, he had all these things that he wanted to do for others and never really mentioned, I want this for me. I want to do this for me. It was about his family. And, you know, Ooh. that's, that's really, honestly, that that's what sits with me, you know, the hardest because he had the skill set to do all those things. There was no doubt in my mind that he would have been a superstar at Maine, Virginia Tech, Alabama, wherever he would have gone, wherever his future took him, he would have been a superstar. Um, and he would have been a superstar on the field and off the field. You know, like that's just who he was. And, right. you know, when when that happens, you know, you, you question a lot of things and then you really dig into it, right? You want to know, man, why, how? What could right, have been done? Exactly. And, you know, for the for the folks that I've connected with that have experienced an aortic dissection and, and thankfully are, are part of that 1% that are still here, you know, their stories are very similar. You know, they, they you know, experienced excruciating pains in those general areas. And they were fortunate enough to be taken to a hospital in the nick of time and, and you know, still be living and breathing. Um, you know, unfortunately, Darius didn't have that opportunity. You know, he passed the the multiple physicals that it took to get to the university, right? He went through those right. physicals. Everything looked good. Everything looked clear. And there was just something that wasn't seen, right? You know, that was something that wasn't known. You know, his, his blood pressure, you know, got to, you know, sky high, I'm sure, right? That's that's ultimately right. what, that's what happened. stressed mm -hmm. and, and got it to that point. And, you know, as a student athlete, the message that I try to portray every since I've started, you know, the, the Spotlight 39 and the 39 Hearts Foundation, right? You know, all I do is talk to student athletes now. And my number one just mission statement to these kids are, you know, don't play through the pain. You know, a simple cramp right. or a simple chest pain may not just be simple. It could be exactly. life or death. And that's that's just, that's just that's what we're seeing, right? And when, you know, you have those conversations, you know, hopefully it sits with the, you know, the, the student athlete because it really can change their life. And you look on social media and you'll hear a story about, you know, uh, in Kentucky a few short weeks ago, a young man lost his life playing soccer, right? Yep. I found a story yep. about a young man in, in, in New Jersey, right? Went to St. John's University in June of 2020. And, you know, he too experienced an aortic dissection, but his happened at night. He was laying in bed. He was he was able to to alert his his parents, and they were able to get him to the hospital. And he's still here. Um, but then you take that, and there's a young man in Pennsylvania that I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago, 13 year old kid, right? Same thing. Football, aortic dissection. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. So it's it's just one of those things that when you experience something, say something. Bring it to somebody's attention, bring it to your trainer, bring it to your coach, make it aware, right? Don't just say, oh, man, man, that, that hurts. <laughs> and it's tough because when you think about football or many sports, even when I talk to my kids and I'm, and I'm trying to reframe that conversation, it's kind of like there is a certain threshold that you want to safely push through, right? So for track, you know, until you felt lactic acid, clench your entire body up and, and you vomit and you faint. I, I don't know if that's, I mean, and, and that's part of the process, but the more you do it, what happens is your body gains a certain tolerance threshold. And so I guess for many of the athletes listening, because I know there's going to be a, a ton of them who, who wonder, well, well, when do I say something? When do I dial back? And I think that that value is changing or, or that level of awareness is changing. And so when we, when we talk about, see something, say something, feel something, say something, you know, it's tough to know where that mark is. Um, you know, sometimes if it's, hey, my toenail hurts, okay, I get it. But right. usually I tell folks, if you're feeling, 
you know, chest pain, chest heaviness, chest tightness, dizziness. If you pass out, those are all reasons to say, stop, pause, let's get it figured out. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and so it, it, it's one of those things where you have to be the best steward, meaning the, the best advocate for your own health. That's it. Um, as much as you want to perform for the coaches, you know, what I tell folks is if you're injured, guess where you're not? You're not on the field. You're not on the court. <laughs> You, yep. you can't be anywhere. So you, you have to make sure that you're safe first. So so when you talked about Darius story, I mean, and again, I know you got him. What did that do? So and you mentioned it. And now I want you to talk about what that did for you and, and how it led to the development yeah. of Spotlight 39. Yeah. So, um, you know, come full circle. Right. After his passing, uh, I stayed true to my promise. Right. I said, I'm coming on opening day. Well, that didn't stop me. I was still going to opening mm-hmm. day. I was still going to be there for him to support him. Um, and, you know, I mentioned to the family, I said, hey, you can come or you can stay. Regardless, I'm hitting the highway and I'm going to Maine. That was the reality. So we looked at flights. We looked at trains, right? We looked at renting, you know, a couple of big buses, like the shuttles. You know, we were just trying to figure out a way how we, how we could get the family there. Well, mm-hmm. when all else fails, what do you do? You pack tight into a bunch of vehicles and you hit the road. So get we, the convoy, yeah. we did just that. We took 17, I believe 17 total family members from uh, Virginia to Orno, Maine or Bangor, Maine, uh, where the University of uh, Maine is. And we made that 13 hour trip. You know, it was, it was a haul. It sure was. Uh, but it was all worth it. We get there. The university was first class through and through. Um, you know, they took time to to walk us through the facilities. Uh, they gave us time. You know, where he he passed on the field. Um, and if you look at my my Twitter feed, man, it's mm. powerful because you know I took his jersey and I took the you know his helmet and I laid it in the exact spot you know where it happened. And when you when you look mm. at that picture, it's the jersey and helmet, and then in the blurred background. You see the jumbotron, their big, you know, their their scoreboard screen, you know, with his memorial photo on it, and it's like you look at that, and it's just it's powerful, because you know he should still be here, and you know it, it, I don't know how else to right. put it. So you know we we go through and you know we you know we're honored, you know he well not we he's honored at the game, you know they they do a moment of silence before the game, um, you know the coaches came the the team came before the the game even started they came out on the field and and met the family and you know just shared you know the short memories that the team had shared stories and it was just you know a nice bonding moment right everybody just you know felt you know the love and you know the the sadness of what happened and you know at that point I said you know what like I can't stop here you know like just because he's gone doesn't mean you know he, he can't still be known you know, we right. can still share his story, right? We still can't, you know, live out his dream. We want people to know who Darius was, right? So how can I do that? So I started working with the coaching staff. I mean, I, I, I hit the road quite a bit in 2018. I, I think I went to five, maybe six University of Maine games between home and away. Um, Man. You know, I came, I showed up, came on the sidelines, and the players were, you know, they were happy to see me. You know, they come up, you know, shake my hand, give me a hug, thank me for coming. And, uh, you know, we got to witness plays that probably should have never happened. You know, like you've seen the movie Angels in the Outfield, right? Right, right. Dating me back to the 90s again. But if you think about that concept of what the movie represented, right, you know, the Angels in the Outfield, there was 110% chance that Darius was was there every single game with them. He was their 12th man. Um in the university through this point, um, you know, they still wear a helmet decal, you know, we're five, almost six seasons later and they still have a 39 helmet decal on their helmets. That's so, powerful. you know, you, you think, man, like, powerful. why do they, why do they do that? Right. You know, he, he would have graduated by now. Typically when you honor someone, you honor them for a season, you know, and then you, you don't let it go, but you, you know, you kind of just, you kind of let it go. You know, I, I don't know how else to put it other than, you know, you kind of just let it go, but s- still think about it. And, right. uh, you know, I say, like, man, like I, I need to do more. Right. So, you know, through the relationships that I built with the staff and, 
you know, they've retired the number 39 jersey. So another player is not going to wear that number at the University of Maine. Um, you know, they've memorialized, you know, his, his locker that he was given. Um, and then to take it a step further, the program's under a $10 million facilities renovation. Part of that remodel, they honored him again. They, they, they took his recruiting photo, and I kid you not, when I say floor to ceiling and you go to a locker room, you know, it's floor to ceiling. That's, that's probably 20 feet, right? 20, 30 feet. Right, right. You know, they've got his recruiting <clears throat> photo on the wall right beside the door when you go in and come out of the locker room. And he's on the wall with the, you know, the other legends of the University of Maine that have gone on to coach and, and have successful careers in the NFL. Like, right. And then there's Darius. And you think about Shit. that, right? And it's like, man, well, what, what more can I do? Well, every year on the 24th of July, the anniversary of his passing, I'm blessed and honored to have the opportunity to join the University of Maine staff, right? And, and we jump on, we, we did a Zoom call uh, the first couple of times where I jump on and, and I got the chance to, to share Darius' story, right? Because you got the new kids coming in and they're wondering, That's man, beautiful. like, A, who's the kid on the wall? And then B, why do I have a 39 helmet, you know, sticker on my helmet? <laughs> so I get to share his story. And, and when, when we finish, they get to know exactly who their teammate was, right? Whether that's a, a that's former or, 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 you know, future teammate, you know, they know that they've got a 12th man with them every single game. And that's just the reality of it. So, you know, you do that and it's like, man, you know, now, now the wheels are spinning. I want to do more. Right. How, how, so it went from just visiting in the season. It went to from just the memorial. It went to, from just a, a sticker on a helmet. It went from just a so. So what more? I, so so then you 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 know you step forward a little bit more and you come to 2020, right? So 2020, obviously COVID year, a lot of things happening right. in, in the year of 2020, uh, and unfortunately for me, uh, I lost my career. You know, I lost my mm. my you know financially stable nine to five career. And, uh, you know, what do you do in those times? You know, you scratch your head and you try to find a new one. Right. I kind of hit a dark place personally. Right. You know, my, you know, my head was kind of in a space where it's never been before. And I'm like, man, like what's going on? Like, what do, where do I go from here? And I was like, well, I've got time. Right. And, and what did I do? <laughs> I can't sleep at night. So my head's racing. I was like, man, like, okay. I like talking to people. You know, I think okay. I'm pretty good at speaking. I said, I, I love agree. sports, right? And, and, and I want to do more for Darius. So what can Keep I do? Going. I said, well, I'm going to start a podcast. Keep in mind, I'd only known what podcast was because of the term. So, you know, I said, I'm going to have a podcast because I'm, I'm just going to talk to kids, right? And my, mm -hmm. my thought process was, you know, I'm going to have kids on. They're going to share their story, right? And we're going to help them get exposure and, and be recruited to play football at the next level, right? I want kids that are unknown, unranked, unrecognized, small town kids that still deserve a shot because those are the kids that mirror where Darius was, right? You know, I want those kids. I like it. Man, all right, well, let me create my, my Twitter page and let me create a YouTube channel. I'm gonna get all these followers and I, you know, people are gonna wanna talk to me. Man, I didn't know what I was doing. Not at all, <laughs> not whatsoever. So I was using Zoom. I was using my built-in webcam on my on my iMac, and then I, you know, I created the Twitter and I said, "Hey, you know, I'm gonna start reaching out to kids." Well, day one, I, I think I got like 25 followers, and I'm excited. You know, I followed 600. You know, I, I reached the Twitter max. You know, and then I got about 25 that followed me back. So then I started sending DMs. Hey, hey, you know, you, you want to jump on my podcast, right? You know, I got a podcast, and uh, you know, I got some some kids that, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll jump on. I'll be cool. Well, I sent them the Zoom invite, you know, and I, I got my, my, you know, it was, you should have seen the setup, but I had a, you know, an old kitchen table that I had down here in the basement with a couple of boxes, my <laughs> iMac sitting on it so that the camera was, you know, in a good position. Right, right. And uh, I said, I'm gonna have a podcast. So I did that. And, you know, you look at the early videos on the channel, it's kind of funny, you know, oh, I like, saw them. I you saw know, them. you know, my first video, though. It's from the heart. Like, I didn't care what it looked like, what the quality right. was, as long as my message was delivered, you know, as to it my why, right? And and that's why I'll never take that video off. Is as, as poor of a quality of video, it, it, it speaks from my heart and it tells you exactly, exactly why I'm where I'm at now. So I said, you know what? I invested even more, right? Got some, some new software and then uh, tried the live thing and it worked out beautifully. And it went from live interviews, right? 
to then getting a co-host from Rivals, which is one of the, the largest national recruiting platforms. Exactly. Right? So he's my co-host on Wednesday night. Shout out to Brandon Howard, a uh, fantastic young man doing amazing things. Um, and then, you know, I was like, man, let's take it a step further, right? Let me, let me give back to these kids even more. So then I reached out to, you know, folks that I've networked with and built relationships with. You know, mm -hmm. I've got coaches from across the country now. You know, I got my guy, Coach McCann in Buffalo, Coach Miller down in San Antonio, and then my guy, Coach E in Blacksburg. And they join me on Tuesday nights. And we do live That's filming. amazing. So kids jump on, parents jump on, coaches jump on. And we play these, you know, the, these young men's highlight films or huddles real time. And we give them real feedback, right? You know, we, we, we tell them how to set up their, their Twitter bios and, and what to do on social media and what not to do on social media. And, you know, we, we're given all these nuggets, right? And now it's, it's exploded to where we've got kids that have come on completely unknown, un, unranked, unrecognized, right? To, mm -hmm. you know, I'm proud to say right now, just the, the 26 class alone, we've probably got about seven or eight kids that were unknown, unranked, to now having several power five offers. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised because of just how passionate you are, right? And, and, and I think this is what helped me to gravitate to, to you in that sense, because you're tenacious, you set a goal, you hit it. And, and the thing is, you continue to challenge yourself. Always. You know, other, th other than driving 13 hours and carrying a caravan and driving back and then being a part of that, then creating that relationship, then saying, hey, let's take it a step further. I'm going to I'm going to go against all odds and uh, and say, hey, I, I don't have anything coming in, but I'm going to step out and still push this. And, and the whole purpose of it is to do exactly what your intent was. And, and I think that that was beautiful that you were still able to in, intertwine him into that mission. And, and most people right now, I mean, look at what you've already done. You've probably touched and I've been on your show. It's wonderful. I love the format. And most people right now would probably break their arm, patting themselves on the back. And I would say, go right ahead. You have done a lot for the game and for the sport. So what was the next iteration of Spotlight 39? And, and how is it reaching people right now? Yeah, so with, you know, the explosion of what I thought was going to be a podcast it turns into a full-blown nationally ranked or nationally branded media, you know, brand is the best way of putting it because that's what it is. Um, you know, it goes from there and I'm like, man, you know, now I'm getting some traction, right? Now I'm making some movement. <laughs> what, can, what can I do now, right? How can I do more, right? So I circled back to what my mission was, right? And, and the mission is I want to carry his name and legacy, right? But I also want to prevent this from happening or try to prevent and raise awareness for this to not happen again, right? Obviously, I know I can't personally stop that from ever happening. But the reality is I can certainly make enough noise to raise awareness for people to know, you know, if you feel something, say something, right? Um, and, and that's really what, you know, the mission is behind the 39 Hearts Foundation, which is my nonprofit foundation with the mission that every strong athlete needs a strong heart. And, and I say that in every single, you know, post that I, I, I put out there, right. You know, I say together we can help save lives because every strong athlete needs a strong heart. And, you know, that's very true because he was the strongest athlete I've, I've ever seen, Man. but he wasn't strong enough. Right. He, it just right. wasn't strong enough. Um, so you take that, and you, you think about the foundation. I started the foundation. It'll be three years this May. So I'm almost three years in, in on the foundation in addition to the media platform, right? And the foundation, it's like, you know, you ask yourself, well, what does the foundation do, right? You know, you already do all these things with, with the recruits right. and student athletes and, and coaches. And, you know, like I, I've traveled to California. I covered St. John Bosco versus Modern Day, right? Essentially the high school Super Bowl. I remember that. You know, yeah. Coach Negro and his staff, Miss Jesse at, at Bosco High School, you know, <clears throat> welcomed me with open arms. Uh, I've got my travel booked. I'm going back to Cali this year uh, in October. Uh, St. Francis Academy is, is traveling from Baltimore here on the East Coast in Maryland. They're traveling to Bosco and Cali. So I'm going to go cover that um, amongst plenty of other Man. games. But... Um, you know, you think about what can you do with a foundation, right? How do you give back in addition to what you're already doing? You know, because essentially the media platforms, you know, I'm giving back, right? I'm helping these kids right. gain exposure. You're, you're doing scholarships. 
you know, but man, how can you really give back and stay true to the mission of raising awareness? And, uh, you know, that, that's the 39 hearts foundation. So, you know, it all started where it ended. And I say that because mm. our first event for the 39 hearts foundation was at the university of Maine. We hosted a heart walk that's on October 10th in 21 at the university of Maine. So mm. where his life ended, his afterlife began. And I was able to, to involve the entire football program. At a, at a division one college and That's they crazy. came out and we walked with a, a purpose. We walked with a cause and, you know, I say we do 3.9 laps around the, the track. Right. So essentially a mile 39. and, you know, it, it all stays true to that. Right. And, you know, we get through the walk and it's like, all right, well now what can we do? You know, one of my first interviews I did with a young man out of Florida, you know, he talked about how he, he slept on the couch you know, in a, in a single, single, you know, bedroom, uh, small house, you know, and he was struggling. His mom was working three jobs to support, you know, him and his brothers. Goodness. And, you know, he was doing everything he could to stay in school so he could keep playing football and try to get to college and better his family. And his, you know, one of his, his statements that just really sticks with me was, you know, he's still wearing the same pair of cleats in his senior year that he got in eighth grade. And I was like, oh, that's, goodness. that's outrageous. Right. And it's not because, you know, any other reason other than he didn't have the means to get new ones to get it. And mm -hmm. so I thought about that and I said, you know what, you know, why not do a cleat drive? So I started what I call the all American cleat drive. And, you know, we raise funds and, and gently use cleats and distribute them to, you know, kids in need, but we don't just distribute them and, and send them out, you know, and like you said, you know, pat yourself on the back. Right, right. And when I send these cleats out, <clears throat> I send them out anonymously. So this year, just kicked off on April 1st, uh, runs through July 31st. You know, it's the third annual All-American Cleat Drive. And the hope is I'm trying to do 25 plus pairs of cleats this year. Um, mm. So we'll see. But that's that's an extra piece, right? And then, you know, through the year, you know, when we, when we raise funds, we take and then we will make, an, I say we, but I, make a, a donation to the American <laughs> Heart Association, not in the foundation's name. We do it in Darius's name because that's what it's about. It's his donation so to the American Heart Association. He's continuing to give back. Yeah. He's continuing to give back so in the process. You take that and then you come into the event aspect, right? And that's taking and, and going to a school on Friday Night Lights, covering their football program, giving their kids exposure, right? But then coming back Saturday morning and hosting a heart walk at that high school for the entire community to raise mm -hmm. awareness, to educate, and, and ultimately to make noise so we can accomplish the mission in hand, right? And we've talked about it quite a bit. We want to, we want to educate these, you know, these, these youth, right? These student athletes and, and other students in the school, what to do in the event of an emergency, right? You know, right. emergencies happen anytime, anywhere, no matter what, that's what life mm -hmm. is. And when these emergencies happen, right? Why not have these kids in a position to know what to do, right? Yeah. Know how to react. Yep. So when they react, right, teach them how to do CPR. Have have portable AEDs available. AED, exactly. Right. Have them available in these schools. School. There's a lot of schools that don't even have them. Why is that? A, right. Why is that a thing? Right. Why does a public school system, private school system, why are they not available? Right. So you take that, and that's what we want to do. Right. So when we do these walks. The, the normal piece of that is the education and all that. And then the funds that we raise, I then give back 50 plus percent of those funds to the students to the that school. registered in scholarship funds, right? It started from identifying your purpose. That's it. Right? That new, and again, and that's what I tell people. I say some, your, your purpose is central and it'll vector you in one direction, but sometimes you get to pick up other things. It just doesn't mean you got to be singularly focused on one thing, which the ultimate goal was to continue Darius's legacy of hard work, giving back, tenacity, and all those things. And you did it in Maine. So fast forward. So, so again, just building that legacy and continuing to build on uh, both, both, both Spotlight 39 and, and, and the foundation. And, and as you moved it forward, Tell us about where we are now. We've got a lot of things cooking. We got the All-American Cleat Drive. We got all these other things where you're getting back. 
But something else that you did is that you, you didn't just hold on and say, I'm going to help this person, this person, this person. You actively seek out. And, and you mentioned it earlier. It's almost like you, you, you search for these pockets where you can inject. And I think that's something that people need to understand about advocacy, right? People aren't, may not necessarily come to you. You actively seek out individuals. So talk about your most recent relationship. And you may have had one since then, but the one I'm referring to is the one that we're going to uh, partner on in the coming weeks and how that came about and, and what that story is. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, full circle again, right? You know, I utilize the platform that I've built on Spotlight 39 on my Twitter page, uh, you know, my following, you know, a little over 11,000, right? So a, a good following. And I saw a post come on my Twitter feed and it was a young man. It was like a GoFundMe page picture, like screenshot. It was a young man in a hospital bed, you know, with tubes all mm -hmm. in them. And, and it was, you know, it was like, man. So of course I opened it up. I want, I, I want to see what's going on. And it was a young man named Zayden Ward. And, you know, I, I'm digging into it, trying to figure out what happened. So, you know, I find a story. Well, on August 31st in, uh, at Monterey High School in 2022, so last football season, um, you know, he scored the game's final touchdown for his high school, you know, stands up to celebrate, and his heart stopped. And he, and he collapses, Goodness. right? So when he collapses on the field, the trainer, you know, immediately responds. And they start the CPR process. And, you know, from, from what I, you know, I'm, I'm told, you know, via, you know, conversations with his mom, uh, you know, they lost them multiple times through the process, right. You know, between the field, you know, the, the hospital, the procedures, like, you know, this young man, he, he's been through the wire and, you know, I'm, I'm very, very, very thankful to say that he's still with us. And, you know, with that story, I said, man, I, I want to find this young man. I want to, I want to, I want to talk to him. I want to talk to his, his, his family. I want to let them know that somebody cares. Right. And, you know, I went to work. I said, Hey, Twitter people, you know, Twitter followers, Twitter family. Mm -hmm. I said, does anybody know this young man? Do they know where he goes to school? Right. Like, can somebody connect me to him or his family? So, you know, several weeks go and then I get a DM. And mm -hmm. DMs from his mother, Miss Cassandra Combs. And I immediately, man, I'm, I'm sitting in Northern Virginia traffic, right? So so I had time to open my phone and look at the message because I was sitting at zero <laughs> miles an hour. Uh, so I, I shot her my phone number. I said, hey, you know, give me a call. I'd love to connect. And immediately my phone rang. And we had well over an hour conversation, my commute home. <laughs> um, so we, we, we talked, right? And, you know, we shared, you know, she, I, I just wanted to hear his story. I wanted to know who he was and what, you know, what type of young man he was and, you know, how he's doing. And, uh, you know, she shared his story and, you know, then I, I, I kind of told her, you know, why, why I wanted to connect. And then I shared my story. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not even my story. My story is just, you know, sharing Darius's story. It's become so much a part of who you are, or at least yeah. this version of you. I mean, yeah. just your level of understanding of the different causes of sudden death, just your level of understanding of the role of the AED, that, that's far and above. And that's why even though you said, well, it's not my story. No, it has changed how you think about your approach to the student athlete. And I think that has translated uh, to probably all 11,000 of those followers and the folks that they're engaging, because that's really what it takes. It, it is, you are this bridge that says, we don't know what to do. There's nothing to do. We'll throw our hands up to, we need help. Yep. You reach your arms out and you connect those two. So it is part of your story and, and, and her ability to talk with you, someone she's never met, never met for an hour yeah, about her it. situation and what's going on with her son reflects that uh, openness and that ability to, 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 to bridge those gaps. It was, you know, just a genuine conversation. You know, we shared, you know, emotional moments, right. Um, to the point where, you know, my voice was getting very crackly and, you know, mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's hard to talk about, but it's easy at the same time, because the more right. I talk about it, you know, the, the easier it is to know that, you know what, I'm, I'm impacting somebody's life. You wow. know, somebody's life is being changed in a positive way. So, you know, we're talking and then I was like, you know what, like, what's your relationship with the school? You know, like, 
you know, would you say that, you know, he's a, he's a good student in school, like the, sc the school would be behind this, you know, because it sounded like the community was. And she was like, man, I, I would love that. And, you know, I was like, you know what, I want to do it a little different. I want to change it up a little bit this time. I said, how about we do a walk? But I want the proceeds to go to you and your family. I want to help your ongoing medical expenses. You know, he's got to fly to Dallas you know, for, for different procedures and such with the, you know, the, the heart doctor in, in Dallas. Right. And that's not cheap. And insurance doesn't cover your flight. They don't cover your hotel. Right. Right. Um, exactly. So those types of expenses aren't easy to come by, especially times that we're living today. Right. So I said, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? And she was like, Oh, I would love that. And I was like, well, let's, let's try to make it happen. I did conversate with, uh, with Mr. Perky Powell, the principal, right. Uh, shared my my vision, you know, my why and, and what I wanted to accomplish from the event, and he was all for it. But he couldn't he couldn't give me the green light. <laughs> he he had to go through the the Lubbock ISD you know process, and so you know he reached out, uh, and then Miss um, uh, Irma Linda, I didn't want to mess up the name, Miss Irma Linda, uh, she's a supervisor of the you know on the board, and she reached out. Her and I we spoke a couple of different times informally got the green light to, to go ahead and put this thing through and, and plan it out. Come full circle, what's happening? May 6th, Monterey High School, we're hosting the Plainsman Heart Walk for Zayden, right? And it's not just a high school heart walk, right? It's not just saying, hey, the football team's going to be here. No, 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 no. We're inviting the entire Lubbock community and surrounding communities. We want to make this thing as big as possible so we can make as much noise as possible so we can yes. make this day as special as we can for Zayden. All at the same time, we want to raise the awareness for heart disease and heart defects within student athletes so that, you know, families don't have to experience what we're experiencing. Right. You know, exactly. if, if we can if we can take one kid and, and prevent this from happening, the reality is that's a win. Right. We just right. saved a life. We just saved a life that probably wouldn't have been saved. And that's the hope. So when we go there, we're going to have several food trucks. Right. The Lubbock community is getting behind this thing. So we got food trucks. We've got bounce houses. We've got a live band. We're, we're going to have a lot of fun. We want to educate these kids, right? So we want the entire student body at Monterey, but we want the entire Lubbock student body to come out. Exactly. Come out, have fun, and learn something, right? Learn what to do in an event of an emergency. Learn how right. to use a portable defibrillator, right? Learn what to do and what to say if something doesn't feel right. That's the hope. That's the mission. And if we can accomplish that, we're going to come out of Lubbock with a lot of data, a lot of analytics. And I want to be able to present this thing to different high schools across the country. And I want to travel this fall so I can cover your game Friday night, give your kids, give your school the exposure, and then come back Saturday morning and host an event for the entire community, raise awareness, and then give back to the student body in scholarship form. It's a win-win-win situation. That's all that I ask. So first off, thank you for allowing your vision to evolve. He reached out half a country away and said, let me come in and change not only the, the climate or the culture or the, or the mindset around this, let me help other people. Let me create a movement, right? Because the difference between a moment, because you could have taken that moment in Maine and, and been, that would have amazed many people. You could have written that in your, in your memoirs, yep. but the difference between a moment and a movement is sacrifice, right? And at the end of the day, when you look at the things that you've done to sacrifice your time, your talent, and your treasure, I mean, it all comes back to one simple purpose. And that is your, your love for Darius, your passion about what he does uh, and, and what he meant to you and your family. And you can see that in the work that you do. And I think others can and will. So I'm excited about because I am totally pumped just to get that message out there and, and to help people understand that oftentimes reducing our cardiovascular risk starts with us, right? We know that there are two groups of risk factors, two groups of things, right? You have the non-modifiable, right? You can't do anything about those. I can't do anything about age. I can't do anything about, you know, gender. I can't do anything about uh, a lot of these other things, but then there's the modifiable, right? And, and whether it's what you eat or, or your awareness to certain symptoms or those type things, those are the things that you can change. And, and that's just touches the surface. You hit on one of the biggest points and 
You talked about this interestingly, right? You talked about the policy piece. Let me pause you there. Just to go ahead. Go ahead. Relevant moment that's happening right now. All right, go ahead. Talk about it. I was going to go there. You go there. Who who do we have right now that's in the public eye that's speaking to the president and Congress on Capitol Hill about exactly what we've been talking about for the last hour and some change? DeMar Hamlin. And, and what's his mission that he wants to accomplish? It seems very closely aligned to what you want to do in How terms of that? improving that awareness. I told you there's a certain center when you're doing the right things. There's a certain synergy to it, and that, and that is what you can say. And that's why when you talked about that policy piece, there's an image that is uh, emblazoned in my head, and it is him walking uh, kind of near the, the, the Capitol steps where the legislators are to talk about this issue and to talk about that risk. And really, that was the motivation for me to create kind of my educational platform or, or format ECA, right? Everyone can assist where we focus on emergency response, CPR and AED use, because those, when you look at the cases where people do well, those are the strategies that really separate outcomes, That's right? It. And at the end of the day, it is that ability to snap on and snap off your ability to engage and assist in that capacity. But again, just so people know, so, so give us the date, Yep. The time and let them know how uh, if they want to register, if they want to uh, donate, if they want to do that. Is there a website? Is there some way they can kind of do those things to, to stay engaged and to, and to still be a part? Let's say they're half a country away. Like I, I know many of your followers <laughs> and other folks are. Yeah. So uh, it's May 6th, 2023. Right. So about five weeks or so from now, um, it's Monterey High School in Lubbock, Texas. So 1,600 miles away from where I'm currently sitting. Um, <laughs> it starts at 12 p.m. We got a, a stop time of 3 p.m., but that's tentative. Uh, we're going to hold, you know, we've got the entire school support behind this thing. So in the event that, you know, we have as much fun as we're hoping to have, you know, maybe we hang out a little bit longer. Uh, but it does start at 12 p.m. And, you know, like you mentioned, right, I don't care if you're half a country away. I don't care if you're in Europe, right? If you want to be a part and you want to support this thing, uh, check out the website, spotlight39.com, and you can click on the Plainsman Heart Walk at the top, uh, or I made it super easy, right? So when you log on a website, you're greeted with a, a nice message from Miss Cassandra Combs, Miss Judy Combs, which is Zayden's grandmother, and Zayden himself. They're, that, as soon as you log on a website, that's what you're greeted with, is a video message from them talking about the walk and, and how that you know they want the entire Lubbock community and surrounding areas to come in and be a part of this thing. So you have the video and then you've got the flyer or graphic, whatever you want to call it, directly under it. You can click there. You can click on the Plainsman Heart Walk, whichever you prefer. Um, and that right there is where you can register. If you are in the area and you want to register to walk or volunteer, we do need some volunteers. Uh, we've got a handful, but we could certainly use more because uh, we anticipate this thing to be big. But if you want to support it from afar or support it in general, uh, you can certainly donate. The donation, there's a big donation button right on that same website. Uh, right on that same page. And then, uh, you know, if you want to take it a step further, you want to sponsor the event. If you're a small business, um, you know, large business, corporate business, ultimately this is about Zayden and this is about, you know, right. making the day special for him and raising as much money as we possibly can to help offset those ongoing medical expenses that aren't easy to handle. Bring it on. We want to have fun. Let's make this thing a community event that, that will go down in the books, right? Exactly. We want everybody to come out of this thing with some great knowledge, some great education, and really feel empowered to speak up and, and, and really make some noise uh, because, you know, we want to accomplish this mission. And the only way that we right. can do this is by partnering together and really making noise, right? I got, I got to give my wife the flowers she deserves, <laughs> uh, you know, because without her, her support, I could honestly, I couldn't do this because, I you know, I, I work the nine to five career, right? You know, I'm an executive for, for a major corporation um, and, and that's the day job, right? So when I get home, right. you know, I'm kissing the babies and I'm turning on this computer and then right. I'm, I'm, right. I'm back to work. And I do this until I'm, I'm ready to close my eyes and then I get up and do it all over again. Um, yeah. So I, I've got to give her, you know, all the credit because, you know, she's an amazing wife, an amazing mother uh, and a, an amazing supporter. You know, she she really does allow me to, to take time away from her and the kids and, and give back, you know, to kids that we don't even know. That's not um, even you know, it's all about giving back and, and helping helping kids that are in need in various you know ways, whether that's in need of cleats. 
via the All-American Cleat Drive, whether that's in need of exposure to help pay for your college, or if that's in need of, in this case, Zayden, you know, he, he, he's, his life's changed, right? But at the Forever. same time, right. you know, we can keep him on track and focused because he may not play football on the field again, but that doesn't mean he can't be involved. And that's, exactly. that's my message to him. I said, don't lose love for the game, you know, right. just see it from a different vision, right? Put a different set of, you know, lenses on or, or however you want to term it. I think and, that's perfectly and, worded. And, and, yep. You know, learn it from a different point of view and still be invested, still be involved because that too can make your career. Exactly. You, you don't have to so, play to be great. First off, thank you. Just because of just what you've done and, and how you've created a conversation where it was whispers before right? You, you created a voice where people were silent before. You've created a platform where people were standing alone. And, and I think for someone to come into a space that has multiple layers of complexity, right? Not to mention the medical aspect and to understand that piece of it. Not to mention the policy piece where you have to coordinate, navigate, insurances, all these different things that have to. But then finally, the player and the parent piece. Right. Those two things are the things that I think oftentimes get lost in the shuffle when we talk about policy decisions and when we talk about funding and when we talk about, you know, how do we get this for a district is those individuals, those voices oftentimes get muted and you give those voices life. So thank you for that. So as we close, if you had three things, it only have to be three. Cause I know you got more than three, but <laughs> if you had some key take home points, uh, for folks that are, that are thinking about, um, kind of, kind of what do I do? Or if I want to get into advocacy or, or, you know, these are Rob's, you know, kind of key three things, what would they be a key couple of things? What would they be? Yeah. So step one, you know, never forget your why. And I say that almost every day on some form of my social media. Never, ever forget your why, um, because if you lose track of your why, then you lose track of the mission and you lose traction. The second piece, right? You take your why and then you find that, that inner passion and then you figure out how you can, you can do more because you never mm -hmm. want to settle for an accomplishment, right? Like you said, I could have I settled and stopped at the University of Maine. And then uh, the third piece is, you know, don't let anybody stop you, right? Don't let anybody stop you. Don't, don't find reasons to stop. No matter what it is, stay consistent. Consistency is key. If you stay consistent, you're gonna stay true to your why, you're gonna stay true to your mission, you're gonna to continue to grow. And that stays true to any form of life, but especially in this piece, when you wanna advocate for something that you're passionate about, something that, that you love and care about, right? You find your why, you find a way to make it bigger and better every single day. And then you, you don't let people stop. Never stop. Keep true to your why. Figure out ways to be bigger, stronger, faster. And I say that because it's student athletes, right? You get bigger, stronger, yes. faster every year. Make your why bigger, stronger, and faster and continue to grow. Man, sage advice from a wonderful person, a beautiful spirit with a ton of energy, right? Finding that why. Huh you know, kind of reaching out for more and never stopping. And, and again, like you said, those, those three things transcend not only advocacy, not only policy, not only sport, but they transcend, you ready for this? Life, right? And when we talk about life, right, we talk about living intentionally. And as you all know, this is the About That Life podcast, where we want to live intentionally forever. And as I spoke with my guest today, we found out that searching for that why, identifying ways to not become crippled by complacency, and finally not taking no for an answer, really pushing forward, are the ways that we can push the envelope. Whether it's through the lens of fitness, nutrition, health literacy, advocacy, or any of those efforts, understanding how to live intentionally with purpose is one of the key things that we must do. Again, I want to thank you for visiting with me for another episode of the About That Life podcast. So as you move forward, continue to ask yourself, what's your why? And push the limits. Hey, this is Dr. Betts. If you enjoyed anything about what you heard, give us a five-star review. If you want to hear different content or have other questions, let us know on all platforms so we can help you live intentionally forever.